Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, August 17th, 2015. Here are our top stories. Tonight. The police state goes worldwide as cops in Spain hand out big fines for taking photographs. Then, Germans use a standard household item to fight their surveillance grid. And... Hillary's emails drudge up memories of Watergate. There's a way to go back to who originated these emails or who received them from Hillary Clinton. So you, you've got a massive uh, amount of uh, data. It, uh, in a way, reminds me of the Nixon tapes. That and to fear, surprise, and ruthless efficiency, you can now add censorship, fines, and total surveillance. Of course, Alex Jones and Rob Dew were in Spain just a couple of weeks ago as they were filming footage of public areas. They were given a stern talking to by the police there. They had their footage erased because there's a new censorship law in Spain. One lady has been fined now, the first person to get a large fine, 800 euros. That's $900 of a fine. Here's Rob Dew breaking this down in some of the footage that you have not seen because they couldn't show this while they were in country. So earlier I got video of a cop on a four-wheeler messing with the driver of this car. And just now a smaller police, a little small police car showed up. And um, <clears throat> you can see him over my shoulder right there driving off. And the cop gets out and literally opens the guy's back door right there. You, get, you can see it still kind of open. He opens the back door and looks in. <clears throat> and uh, the guy's inside. I guess he's fixing something. I think he's fixing the um, elevator. But um, it, it's just funny <laughs> the way they act. And the other guy was sitting in there on his uh, cell phone. So that is the police presence here in Spain. Total oppression. Rob do Infowars.com. Absolutely. And if we go back and look at that article from RT, Spanish woman fined 800 euros for a photo of a police car in a disabled bay. That would be handicapped parking in the United States. And that would be about a $900 fine. They say this was a police car that was parked in handicapped parking. She posted a picture of it on Facebook and said, park wherever you please and you won't even be fined. Well, it turns out she will be fined for posting that picture. And that's what they did. They tracked her down within 48 hours. If you look at that picture that's up at the top of that article, Censoria es Tyrania. I'm not, I don't speak Spanish, but I think I understand that means censorship is tyranny. And that's precisely what we're looking at. This is something that is rolling out globally. It is global tyranny. It is total surveillance. And it is controlling everything we see and do. Now, this is the law in Spain. Spain's citizens' security law, the citizens' security, they use the same techniques they use here, saying that this is a Patriot Act when it is the most unpatriotic thing ever, saying that it's the USA Freedom Act when they take our freedoms. And here they're saying this is for the citizens' security. No, it's not. They say the unauthorized use of images of police officers that might jeopardize their or their family's safety or that of protected facilities or police operations is prohibited, and the fines can go up to 30,000 euros. So they gave it to her a little bit ahead of the, the minimum of 600 euros. Uh, they say that they had to arrive and park in that area because they had to get to a case of vandalism very quickly. Perhaps that's true. Perhaps it isn't. Nevertheless, you should not be fined for criticizing or questioning the authorities. That is a Spanish Inquisition. We see that happening here as well in this country. Take a look at what's happening in Germany. People there are upset about their surveillance state there. Some are microwaving their ID cards in order to stifle the surveillance state. They say that uh, in this article we have on Infowars.com, Americans have become quite complacent, and that's true. We're getting used to it. They've moved the Overton window, but Germans are still resisting somewhat. They say, and of course, it's very understandable. They've lived under the Nazis. They've seen what happened in East Germany under the Stasi surveillance state. They have a understanding of where this all leads. And we've had William Benny on our program many times talking about how he spent his career watching, surveilling these authoritarian, totalitarian states. He knows precisely where these kind of policies lead. Well, in Germany, they have ID cards, and the Germans don't like the idea that they're being spied on. So some people have been putting up YouTube videos talking about how you can destroy the 
surveillance uh, capabilities of these cards by microwaving them. Well, they just had this week a 29-year-old man who was arrested, arrested at the Frankfurt airport after it was discovered that he had microwaved his ID card to destroy the microchip. According to German law, they say ID cards are government property and cannot be destroyed. See, you are government property, not the ID cards. Understand, you are the person who is the property of the government. Just as we talk about gun control or any of these other aspects, they're really about people control. And when they give you an ID card, make that a condition of getting a job, of moving around. And we're going to be talking about the solutions that are being floated about immigration control. And that is something that is going to lead us to living in a kind of West Bank existence that we've not seen in this country that we do not want to see. We need to shut these ideas down first. But they point out that the man is not alone. There's been many videos showing this. They say 39% of German adults are fearful of the future of digital technologies. That's surprisingly low considering their recent history. And of course, they point out that uh, Snowden's leaks have had a lot to do with their concerns. But of course, we have a presidential candidate who says that Donald Trump says that uh, Snowden is a total traitor. Well, you know who is a total traitor? Hillary Clinton. We now see that there are 305 documents with potential classified information. This report from the Washington Times says that more than 300 of her emails that they've looked at, which is 5.1% of those processed so far, have been flagged for potential secret information. They say that the reviewers have so far only screened 20% of the 30,000 emails. So that means that there could possibly, if this rate holds up, there could be more than 1,500 messages that will have to be sent to intelligence community agencies known in the government as IC in order to screen the classified information. These messages have been redacted as being classified. And of course, they're being made public. It's a very complicated situation, but they're being made public because it's not only questions about security, but it's also a FOIA request that they're trying to get them to comply with. Judge Sullivan, who is taking a look at this, has set, they say, a strict schedule for the State Department to meet and releasing the emails on a monthly basis. The department, however, has missed the July target of, by more than 1,000 pages of emails. Washington Times also reports that when the State Department officials first discovered Clinton's personal email accounts contained classified information, they did not seize her thumb drive, but they rather provided her a safe to keep that thumb drive in. That allowed the attorney to manipulate things, and they are concerned that there are employees within the State Department, or as they call it, uh, Foggy Bottom, not to be confused with the Soggy Bottom boys of uh, Brother Where Art Thou. They say some career employees at Soggy Bottom have now alerted the intelligence community to irregularities that they fear may hide from the public the true extent of classified information that passed through Clinton's personal account. These concerns that the employees that are at the State Department who are blowing the whistle on this say that they're concerned that one or more State Department attorneys involved in the production of her emails to Congress and the federal court have ties to her private attorney's firm, creating at least, they say, the perception of conflict of interest. No, really, the perception of conflict of interest, of course there's a conflict of interest in this. Bob Woodward is pointing this out. He strongly attacked Clinton, and this may be signs that the establishment is ready to finally throw her under the bus. Bob Woodward of the Watergate uh, reporter's fame compared the email controversy engulfing presidential candidate Hillary Clinton to the downfall of President Richard Nixon. This is the Washington Examiner pointing this out. He says, follow the trail. This is what Bob Woodward said. He said, these are all emails. Well, they were sent to someone or someone sent them to her. So if things have been erased here, there's a way to go back to these emails or whoever received them from Hillary Clinton. So you've got a massive amount of data. In a way, it reminds me of the Nixon tapes, thousands of hours of secretly recorded conversations that Nixon thought were exclusively his. And he goes on to say, it's extraordinary. Again, it's the volume, 60,000 emails, and Hillary Clinton has said that 30,000 of them, half, were personal. So she deleted them. Who made that decision, he says? Well, of course she did. He says, what's on those emails? I would love to have all those 60,000 emails and read them. It would be a character study about her personal life and also what she did as Secretary of State. Step back for a moment. The big question about Hillary Clinton is, who is she? Is she the secretive hidden person? 
or is she this valiant public service? Look at those 60,000 emails, you're gonna get some answers. Here's the real issue. Why would she even have her own personal email server? And why would she be putting any classified documents? And as we saw last week, some of those classified documents were things that were intercepted intelligence from satellite images, things that came from the NSA. They were highly classified. They were not only not top secret, they were above top secret. This is something that we see happening over and over again, where the elites tell us that we, they have to know everything about us, but we are not allowed to know anything about them. They have to destroy the Constitution, they have to destroy our individual rights, all in the name of national security. And yet when Hillary Clinton violates national security protocol, when she puts these emails on a secure, on an unsecured server, opening them up for espionage, because of course there's going to be every country in the world is going to be trying to intercept the emails of the Secretary of State. When she does that, she is given a pass. This is precisely what is wrong with the surveillance state. The fact that they need to know everything about us, we're not allowed to know anything about them. It invites corruption. Here's what else invites corruption. Again, going back to Europe again, the TTIP, people are getting concerned about that because it's getting the same treatment as the TPP does here. Of course, the TTIP is the European version, the transatlantic partnership that will join Europe to the United States in a quote unquote free trade agreement uh, it is far more than that, as we've pointed out many times. The TPP is a Trans-Pacific Partnership. That is the agreement that would tie the United States to Asia, to the Pacific Trade Agreement. Now, of course, in the United States, we are not allowed to see these agreements. And now the same thing is happening with the TTIP in Europe. And people are having something to say about this. This is from The Independent, a European uh, paper. They say the European Commission is making the secret transatlantic trade and investment partnership trade deal even more secret. They've introduced a new rule that means that politicians can only view the text in a secure reading room in Brussels. Does that sound familiar? Yes, it is a global conspiracy to hide things from us, to do things that they do not have legitimate authority to do. We see the same things happening with these trade agreements. Everywhere across the world, we see the same things happening with taking away people's informed consent with vaccines. Let's go on and read what they're saying about this. Of course, this is a change of policy that took place on July 24th. They say that with this being submitted to national parliaments, hundreds of people can now have actually uncontrolled access. Well, see, everyone should be able to see this. This is something that should be a matter of public record. This is something that our elected representatives should be able to see and should be able to discuss with the people because this is something that affects all of us. But when they talk about these trade agreements, they talk about us as not being someone who is vested in this. We are not someone that is allowed to see this because we are not uh, invested in this whole process. Now here's what Robert Smith uh, said on NPR, talking about what happens in the United States, similar to this. He said, in Washington, D.C., they love secrecy, but even by Washington standards, this amazed me. In the basement of the U.S. Capitol, he said, there is a room, a locked soundproof room, and the only people allowed in this room are U.S. senators, and they can't bring their assistants, they can't bring their phones, they can't even take notes in there. Inside this room, is not the codes for our nuclear weapons. It's not the CIA's files. It's not the documents that tell us that an alien landed in Roswell. No, this room is the text of a trade deal. Well, yes, it may not be the nuclear codes. It may not be the CIA files. It may not be the UFO files, but it is something that is far more important than a trade deal. This is something that one of the few senators who's bothered to read it, Senator Sessions, has told us this is about creating a transnational governance. This is going to create a transnational commission. This is going to be a living document. They will be able to add China and other countries. And of course, I mentioned China because they're using China as a foil to push for the passage of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. But then once they get it passed, they can add China to it. They can add any country to it. They can change any aspect of this. And it goes far beyond, far beyond any trade deal. It affects our copyrights, it affects patents on medicines, it affects a vast array of our economy. But this is about global consolidation. And that is why 
It is more closely guarded than the nuclear codes and the CIA files and the UFO files. It's because this is the blueprint, this is the pattern, this is the implementation of worldwide government. We've seen this from the Trilateral Commission that was put up by Brzezinski talking about how they were going to have an Asian, a European, and a North American focus. We now see those three blocks being consolidated through these so-called trade agreements, and it is all kept secret because they, you are not a stakeholder. See, that's the word that they use. We don't have a stake in this as citizens. Our elected representatives don't have a stake in this. And this is something that's going to be coming down the pike. There will be no uh, opportunity for any amendments to this. It will be a quick up and down vote. There will be no way to block it. There will be no way to amend it. Well, stay with us and we're going to come back and we're going to talk about another method of control, and that is the control of our transportation. There's been some moves on that, speculation about an Apple car. We're going to give you some interesting insights into that. Why is the military involved in this testing? Stay with us. We'll be right back. Now, over the weekend, the Drudge Report carried a series of articles about a possible new development in Apple's self-driving cars. Now, a lot of people are interested in what the new products from Apple are going to be, but we're looking at this not because of that, but because of government control of transportation. This is big business. It's big government, and it is big brother. It's something we should all be very concerned about. And when we look at this story that was broken by uh, The Guardian, Looking at emails going back and forth between Apple and a testing facility, I find it very alarming to see the involvement of the U.S. military in testing these. Of course, we remember that the Autobahn was created by Adolf Hitler as a way to move their military equipment very quickly from one place to the other within the country. Eisenhower had tried to move some military equipment in the Northeast, and he'd written a small book about how difficult it was and how we needed to improve that. So when he saw the Autobahn in Germany, he created the interstate system in the United States as president. Now, of course, we've enjoyed that as civilian freedom of uh, movement. It's been a very freeing thing to have here, in spite of the fact that they use that to exert control of a 55-mile-an-hour speed limit. There have been those types of things. But even Adolf Hitler, as he paraded around in a Volkswagen, the Volkswagen was a small, cheap car that made transportation more readily available to individuals. It was a freeing technology. I don't think that's going to be the case with self-driving cars. I don't think they're going to set up a separate lane for the automated cars and let them coexist with people in, who are driving their own cars. And neither does Elon Musk or, many, Musk or any other people who have talked about this. They say this is going to be eventually the, and sooner than you think, the outlawing of human drivers. We're being told that the cars will be far safer than any human driver. Of course, they'll be programmed by humans. So we can take that with a grain of salt. Understand, this is going to be computer-driven. It will be government-controlled. It will be part of the total surveillance and control grids. Let's take a look at this story here. This is from The Guardian. They say documents confirm that Apple is building a self-driving car. They say they are going to be, they're scouting locations in the San Francisco Bay Area to test it. They're that far along with it. They say documents show the off-rumored Apple car project appears to be further along than many suspected. They met secretly with officials from something called the Go Mentum Station. This is a 2,100-acre former naval base near San Francisco. And they inter intercepted emails. They said, we'd like to get an understanding of timing and availability for the space and how we would need to coordinate around other parties who would be using it. And the interesting thing about this, I think, too, is the Guardian's investigation shows that they're looking quite a bit at intercepted emails that they got back and forth between these two countries, companies. And of course, as a German minister said just last week, the vast majority of surveillance that's going on is not impacting national security. No, it is about corporate espionage. That's why there's the close connection between the NSA, the surveillance state, and these corporations that are doing it. And that's why they're setting up CISA, which is the newest instantiation of CISPA. Going on with this, they say the base is closed to the public. Now, they say this is former Navy base, but understand it is still closed to the public and it is still guarded by the military. Think about that. Think about that. This is like an AP Hill where they did asymmetric warfare, planning on fighting Americans in American cities and urban settings and another place that they have down at Camp Lejeune where it's a more suburban, more rural area. This is our government 
training to fight Americans. This is our government now in this case training to control our transportation. They say it is the largest secure test facility in the world. This is their own uh, uh, copy from Gomentum Station. For the testing, validation, and commercialization of connected vehicle applications and autonomous vehicle technologies to define the next generation of transportation network infrastructure. And they're building an infrastructure that is not going to allow you to have anywhere near the kind of freedom that you have now. They say Apple has hundreds of engineers that are quietly working on automotive technologies in an anonymous building uh, in Sunnyvale that's uh, just a small amount of distance from their main campus. And in these emails, they say, we would like to meet in order to keep everything moving and to meet your testing schedule. In May, an Apple senior vice president, Jeff Williams, called the car, quote, the ultimate mobile device. Now, there's a lot of people who believe that Apple is not going to be doing this anytime soon. Of course, there's an article from The Verge saying you won't be driving an Apple car anytime soon. One of the things that they point out is that it takes five years even for an automobile company to get something into production, even though they're experienced with it, even though they have an assembly line. But going back to this other article, they point out that the CEO of Apple has met with Fiat Chrysler boss. He has toured BMW's electric car assembly line in Germany. Understand that Apple doesn't make anything. Apple doesn't make their iPhone, they don't make their computers, they subcontract this out to people who are in the business of making those things. They don't manufacture it themselves, they subcontract it out. They design this and then they subcontract it out. So if they're at the stage where they're already doing testing, this is something that is very far along. And Apple's involvement in this, I think, just underscores what big business this is, what a big potential this is. We see that Google is involved in this, we've seen Uber, talking about how they were going to make private ownership of cars go away. And we've seen the mainstream press just within the last couple of weeks talk about how the automate, autonomous self-driving taxi was going to save us from global warming. This is a full-on push from the government, from Wall Street, from the largest corporations that we have in this country. They talk about how Google, Tesla, Volkswagen, Mercedes, many other car makers are all involved in this. They have to file their applications with the California Department of Motor Vehicles. Apple does not want to do that. They want to keep this secret. And finally, this is one of the things that I thought was very interesting. The name of the place is the Contra Costa Transportation Authority. Almost sounds like something that the CIA would be involved in. And they point out that Honda has signed a quarter of a million dollar memorandum of understanding to use the facility for testing. They say that Tesla was looking at it, but listen to this account. They say, when engineers from Tesla Motors tried to tour the Gomentum station in April, armed soldiers at the base refused entry to foreign-born workers and a manager who would not divulge his social security number. And then there was an email that came back and it said, at this point, I'll retract our interest in this test site until the process is worked out. That's what the manager said when he wrote the station, uh, Gomentum Station's Jack Hall. It appears that the Guardian has intercepted emails on the side of Gomentum Station, so they're able to see these uh, emails from Tesla, from Apple. Again, we see that the people at Tesla seem to be a bit more concerned about the negative consequences of technology. Here you got one of the managers who refused to give his social security number. Good for him. That's exactly what we need to see coming uh, from people. Now, as many people are saying, they don't believe that we're going to be seeing a Apple car anytime soon. That's the Verge's take on it because they don't believe that Apple has their production lines up. And as I just pointed out, I don't expect them to use production lines. But just as an aside, Apple could very easily get into this with their liquid metal technologies alloys. This is something that is very unusual. If you haven't seen liquid metal, it is has very, very unusual properties. I know some engineers who have worked there and they had told me a long time ago that Apple had gotten exclusive rights to use liquid metal for consumer goods. Now they're talking about they have just entered their third amendment to this agreement to extend their capability to keep an exclusive right to use liquid metal. This is something that among its unique properties are its high strength, its corrosive resistance, its lightweight, and its malleability. This is a very unique substance that they're talking about here. And one of the things that would make this ideal for Apple would be that they would be allowed, they would be able to do some very unusual looking vehicle bodies. They would be able to pour this and mold this like plastic. 
and yet it has metallic properties that far exceed many of the metal properties that we've seen in other metals. Now, moving on, as we look at foreign policy, we've now had some details emerge in an interview yesterday from Donald Trump. Understand that he's been running for president for quite some time, and there's very little on his website that actually talks about what he would do with policies. And we're going to talk about that in the next segment. He's put up his first issues statement, and that's about immigration. But on MSNBC, actually it was on NBC's Meet the Press, he was actually asked some questions about policy, not about his personal life. And what he had to say was very interesting. He advocates sending ground troops to fight the Islamic State. The question is, is it enough for a candidate to feel our pain? We need to ask, what would they do? What are their solutions? Do we want another president who is going to shed blood for oil? That is precisely what he is proposing to do. We have wounded warriors who have been taken advantage of. Why did we go to Iraq in the first place? We're not going to address that. Instead, he's proposing that we send ground troops to Iraq in order to take over the oil fields so that we can then give compensation to the troops. He's simply going to repeat the same problems. This is like rinse and repeat the mistakes of the Obama administration and the Bush administration. Stay with us when we come back. We're going to talk about immigration. We'll be right back. Can the federal government take credit for saving us from a plot of its own creation? The FBI has foiled about 17 plots to kill Americans during the past 10 years. They all have a common and reprehensible thread. They were planned, plotted, controlled, and carried out by the federal government itself. Those were just brief examples how the United States government sometimes assists and completely manufactures terror attacks. Now, with that in mind, on our recent trip to Ferguson, Missouri, myself and Joe Biggs had a chance to meet a man who said that he had previously worked in law enforcement and had information about terror attacks that had been largely ignored. Now, he didn't have any physical evidence, but here's his story, and you can hear it for yourself. My name is John Griggs. I'm 29 years old. I've been in law enforcement since uh, the day I turned 21. I swore in in Paducah, Kentucky um, as a deputy. And um, I came to Missouri in 2012 after my home burned down and started a career here. Um, I was the gang task force officer for the Missouri Department of Corrections. And I was assigned to Pacific, Missouri. And my job was to investigate, validate, and marginally disrupt organized crime within the institutions. Um, in February of 2014, I came across several documents where an offender within the Missouri Department of Corrections was teaching others how to build improvised explosive devices. I'm not going to say everything about that for um, confidentiality purposes, but what I will say is that I was told to disregard a known terrorist. Um, I did not. I contacted someone and they led me to the St. Louis County Intelligence Unit where I had handed over the instructions for the improvised explosive devices and an address book with 60 suspected names in it. I was told to give it back to the offender and leave it alone because my captain was not going to get sued by a Muslim. I did not. I lost my job. On June the 28th of 2014, I was attacked by two offenders carrying a 7-inch um, knife. One offender tried to grab me and put the knife right here in my side and kill me, right here in my ribs. Um, I have the weapon. I recovered it. I took my handcuffs and I restrained the offenders. I used the least amount of force necessary. I was written up for excessive use of force. Um, and I said I knew I'd be okay after the incident was over. Um, I told my lieutenant I need to smoke a cigarette. I said, but I knew I'd be fine. During the debriefing for the use of force, my lieutenant then asked me, how did you know you'd be okay? And I said, because Jesus Christ walks with me. And I firmly believe that. I was immediately, immediately, they took my badge, they took my weapon, and they made me take a mental evaluation. For one month, I was on administrative leave for mentioning Christ Jesus. For one month. Then I was discharged. When I passed the mental evaluation I wasn't supposed to pass, I came back and I was fired and I was criminally charged for theft of property by the inspector general and then it was immediately dismissed because St. Louis County 
intelligence unit had every document I handed over to them. I was discharged from my position and I have not been able to hold a law enforcement commission since for stopping the terrorist attack. Now we have a story on Infowars.com over the weekend. The Philly Tribune pointed out that the Philadelphia School District registers 800 students speaking 40 languages from 70 countries. How do we cope with totally open borders? We're going to have a report from John Bound coming up, and then we're going to take a look at the suggestions from Donald Trump. What would Donald do? And of course, when we look at this, the massive amount of resources that are gonna to have to be used in the schools, that's gonna to have to be paid for by property taxes. Are we going to literally be driven from our homes in order to pay for the, kind, the education of people coming to our country from all over the world without any control? There's also the issue of crimes. We see that uh, Sheriff Joe has now been blocked from having any lawsuits about the Obama administration's immigration policies. They said that he doesn't have any standing. They don't think any of us have any standing. That's why so many people are so angry about immigration. Here's a report from John Bowne, Amnesty for Mass Murders. Republican presidential candidate John Kasich, who has flip-flopped on the hot potato issue of illegals immigrating into the U.S., sees a pot of gold at the end of the election rainbow by now catering to illegal voters. Kasich reportedly said to CNN, the 12 million who are here, we ought to find out who they are. If they've been law-abiding over a period of time, they ought to be legalized and they ought to be able to stay here. There are people who contribute a lot to the U.S. Kasich must have missed the reason Trump is so popular in the polls. Americans are fed up with the slow transformation of their country into a third world. And when a lawmaker like Maryland Governor Larry Hogan puts into action a plan to create some kind of accountability for the tens of thousands of illegals with criminal records being released onto American streets, he is met with a horde of the now typical pro-illegal demonstrators who have zero respect for our country and our laws. The group titled Casa de Maryland said Larry Hogan's voluntary collaboration will lead to the deportation of parents, siblings, and neighbors while shredding community trust. As jails garner the reputation as locations around which ICE agents wait for release, family members will be too frightened to visit or retrieve their loved ones. Meanwhile, the hubris grows. A Dallas tree service owner that had already been raided by immigration authorities and warned not to continue to employ illegal aliens, turned around and did so through shell staffing companies. Apollos Davis Phillip now faces up to six months in prison because small business owners like himself believe that U.S. laws just don't apply and that we should be thankful that they're doing the work Americans supposedly won't do. Besides, Americans are too busy standing in long lines at food banks that they have had to rely on since the Wall Street criminals deep six the stock market back in 2008. Meanwhile, the rest of America without blinders on has to live in fear when they see stories like this. The brutal deaths of a grandmother and two teens in Florida earlier this week were pinned on an illegal alien who crossed the Texas-Mexico border. Police in Fort Myers arrested Bolivian national Brian Omar Hyde, 19, Tuesday, driving on the wrong side of the road with no license and blood on his clothes and body. The Lee County Sheriff's Office suspects Hyde of carrying out the extremely violent slayings of his cousin and roommate. Lieutenant Matt Sands described the grisly incident. It was an extremely violent scene, even for us, Sands said. All homicide scenes are normally violent, but this scene was what we considered unimaginable. According to the lieutenant, there were indications the victims died due to sharp force trauma, though no murder weapon was identified. According to Belize media outlets, Hyde and two other men were suspects in a double murder case back in October 2013. Hyde's uncle, Russell Hyde, is also reportedly a known criminal in Bolivia who is suspected of decapitating and dismembering two people in May. This is an example of the kind of illegal Kasich, Jeb Bush, and the Obama administration would have us all ignore. As if it's just one bad apple. Areas of New Mexico and Arizona are controlled by the drug cartels that deliver illegals to the U.S., where mass murder 
Execution style slayings, sexual assaults, kidnappings, shootings, armed robberies, burglaries are all par for the course within the world of illegal immigration. As the Obama administration raises the flag over the U.S. Embassy in Havana for the first time in 54 years, the message is loud and clear to the rest of the world. Come plunder America. Our laws don't apply to you here. We will divide and bring the American people to their knees together. John Bound for Infowars.com. Well, from the beginning of his campaign, Donald Trump has been talking about immigration. But he hasn't had any concrete proposals. He hasn't had any proposals about any issue, as a matter of fact. But he just put up the first issue, and that is immigration. This is what Donald Trump would do about immigration. First of all, he would make Mexico pay for the wall. Now, think about what's going on. If we're going to have Mexico pay for the wall, if we are going to triple the number of immigration and customs officers, are we going to create something that is a, essentially a prison here in the United States? Those walls, of course, can be used to keep us in. They're not going to be effective at keeping others out. We already have many reports of a vast tunneling system that is already in place. In the war on drugs, we have had People who are dying of overdoses in this country continually. You can't keep drugs out of prisons. You're not going to be able to keep people out of this country by force. We need to look at what is incentivizing them coming in, and that is our welfare state. We need to remove the incentives. I don't see that in here. I see him removing anchor babies. Stay with us when we come back. We're going to be talking about vaccines. It is not just a national conspiracy to take away our informed consent. It is international. Stay with us. We'll be right back. There is a national and international agenda to remove our informed consent. We can see this in Australia. This report today, having preschoolers have to have vaccines, no jab, no play. In other words, you can't get childcare or kindergarten unless you get a forced vaccine. Now, how does this look in America? Well, yet another place, Rhode Island, and here's Dan Badandi with a report on forced vaccinations to close out our show. Dan Badandi, Infowars.com here in Providence, Rhode Island at the Rhode Island Department of Health. And in about an hour from now, they're going to have an open public meeting where the public gets a question and ask the experts on a new mandated law that seventh graders have to have a HPV vaccine prior to entering school this year. Now, we have two senators here in Rhode Island, Josh Miller and Gail Golden, trying to push through a Senate bill 0381 relating to education immunizations that annuls religious exemption. So we're going to try to run it to Josh Miller or Gail Golden, and we're also going to ask the public their thoughts on this new mandated law. I'm Dr. Nicole Alexander Scott, the director of the Rhode Island Department of Health, um, and uh, we are going to be engaging in a dialogue tonight about HPV and HPV vaccines. Over a dozen concerned parents showed up to voice out against the HPV vaccine mandate. They had a lot to say in contrary to what the Rhode Island Department of Health was reporting. You mentioned earlier that there are no reported cases of major adverse events from this immunization. My two older sons received it without event. Um, you also mentioned that any report gets thoroughly investigated. Is that correct? Yes. What, what How does it get investigated? The if, vaccine adverse events reporting system. Okay, they if, get that, if, someone, if, if an adverse event would be, were to be reported through that system, that would get investigated. Yeah. Okay. My stepson, 10 months ago, had the HPV immunization and a week later went blind in his left eye. We became concerned, took him to the emergency room where he had a CAT scan of his brain that was normal. His vision still has not fully returned. We reported it through that adverse event. We're waiting for the investigation to happen. I would describe that as a relatively major event. So I'm offended that I, might, I was insulted by them, and I'm disturbed that the reporting doesn't lead to an instant investigation, and that you can present it tonight as having zero adverse effects. The loss of vision counts. So I also, one more thing, and then I'll sit down and shut up. Um, False comfort concerns me. This immunization does not, doctor, prevent cancer. Can we agree that the word prevention in your um, Department of Health marketing is an overstatement? People are gathering on both sides of this. 
And I guess that's where my question comes in, is why, if the CDC is not making this a required vaccine, which to me says they don't have enough evidence to make it a required vaccine, why is Rhode Island taking the stance of using all of the recommended and making them required? And I would just love to hear the, the rationale behind that from their perspective. Um, CDC only recommends they do not require vaccines to use the no, exemption you're, you're if going they don't on and know on about this and that, and it sounds very reassuring, but it sounds like to me bland reassurance. The fact that I, mean, I think it takes a lot of courage to come up here and tell people that, that this vaccine is safe and effective when the, the research isn't there to support it. And I think it's very nice to say you can get an exemption when many of these poor people may not be aware of it, and they may not really know the safety issues and the efficacy issues and they, they're going to trust the Department of Health and their mandate. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of speaking on both sides of your mouth here. Is, is it safe? Is it effective? And if so, why are you not presenting us with the data? And the reason is that the data doesn't exist. The religious exemption has been in Rhode Island for a while, um, but I've heard from a lot of parents where a lot of the school nurses bully parents when they want to get a religious exemption. I, I know one parent who was told, okay, I need a letter from your pastor, I need this notarized, I need this, you know, or by your, you know. They single the children out too. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, it, you know, so I think that there's a lot of miscommunication between the Department of Health and the school <laughs> that's requiring this. And it's, it's very confusing for parents and it makes, it makes our trust in the If you have a child who's at school who has a religious exemption, and their eyes happen to be red, they're sent home because they are unvaccinated. They may be spreading something much more serious than not getting enough sleep the night before. There's lots of bullying. There's, you know, there's lots of parents out there who, when you say that exemptions are available, readily available, whoever wants them, that is completely untrue. Even as parents of children who are clearly and undeniably vaccine injured, People have to quit their jobs to take care of their children to prove that they qualify for one of these exemptions, and it's not an easy process. And to add all. to what you're saying, you want to take a religious exemption in a, in a public building where, other than the Pledge of Allegiance, if I use the word God, I'm showing the door. So how are you going to be, how is a 7 year old bo why, or 11-year-old bold enough to say, to be like you I'm said, religious. a religious exemption? Why can't it just be a choice <clears throat> exemption? Why do I have to say it's religious. based on religion, other yeah. than it's based on me informing myself and I simply disagree with the information that yeah. you put out. I spoke to Senator Miller earlier this week. We are the ones at the Department of Health who make the ultimate determination about whether or not religious exemption should or shouldn't be there. And with this process and even in our own decision making, we had chosen to hold off on that because we knew that parents wanted to have that available. I read a quote by Senator Josh Miller actually today in a newspaper disparaging parents from uh, for having used religious exemptions as he put it inappropriately. Um, however, I feel like we're being ordered into it and I think that there needs to be another option. I am not religious. Right. Why should I have to use a religious exemption right. when yeah. I don't want to give something to my child but I have researched thoroughly and do not feel comfortable giving to her. Right. Even though Senators Miller and Golden were nowhere to be found, I had a chance to speak with some of the parents who were very upset about the Department of Health undermining their parental rights. They say that the vaccine is effective, but it, what it, the studies actually show is that there is a 0.58% reduction in cervical preneoplastic changes. There's no evidence that it has prevented even one case of cervical cancer, yet the Department of Health is putting forth to the community that this vaccine is safe and it does prevent cervical cancer. There's no research evidence to support that. And when you ask them about this, they just say the research says they never produce a single paper. And as a parent, uh, what are your thoughts right now that knowing this is mandatory? And this is not a contradiction. They said it's a choice, but it's mandatory. I mean, what are your thoughts? I'm extremely concerned about it because it shouldn't be mandatory. It feels like a gross overstep of, of governmental role for me. Uh, my, my thoughts as a parent is that I believe we're, we're seeing one side of the picture or one side of the equation. We're being told it's a mandate. We're being told that it prevents cancer, which there's no clinical research to show that it does. Uh, and then we're not being told that we have a choice and that we have the capability of uh, seeking a religious exemption. But how do you <clears throat> suggest that we have a choice in this matter? To, to vaccinate our children or not with something that has 
you know, $30 million has been rewarded uh, in lawsuits across the country for people who are suffering damages from this uh, highly uh, dangerous uh, array of ingredients that are being pumped into our children's veins. And do you feel that the HPV vaccine is safe enough for them to mandate it? I, I don't think they even have the right to mandate any vaccine, I, even, even if there were no injuries from this vaccine. It's none of their business to be um, mandating this for a disease that can't be spread within school. I mean, I, I guess I understand their intentions are okay, but I think that it's, they're, they're out of line with this. Now, as a parent, doesn't it undermine your ability to choose and pick what's best for your children? Right, and, and that's why I'm here, because I think that for this vaccine, since it, it can't be transmitted with a school, I think it's up to me and, and my pediatrician um, to decide if we're gonna administer it or not. And now, I just want to get you a quick comment on this. Now, according to naturalnews.com, that one of the lead Gardasil developers, he clearly stated, to clear his conscience, he admitted that the vaccines, the HPV, is useless and deadly. What are your thoughts on that? I, I think that the uh, evidence is in in. I don't know if it is going to be useless. It may have some positive effect, but we don't know how much of a positive effect, and we, don't, we haven't established a risk-benefit ratio. In every medical intervention, you have to look at what the risks are and what the benefits are. They haven't done those studies. And as usual, officials, the so-called experts, had no direct answer but used circular reasoning for the public's questions. But however, we had religious exemption attacked in California as two senators here in Rhode Island already tried to do. So folks, we're in trouble unless the parents in Rhode Island stand up and say no to mandatory vaccines. And how direct is the Rhode Island Department of Health right here when they got the former director chasing a pilgrim with a syringe? Folks, that's, you know, that's the agenda right there, folks. That's exactly what they're trying to do, force inoculate the entire population for population control. Dan Bedondi, InfoWars.com.